over to our next speaker. I'm now going to introduce Rhys Thorpe. I love the first sentence of his bio because it says, Rhys is a social worker and counsellor who has been working with children and young people and families for more than 10 years. Uh, we love it. He has experience working in supervised contact, foster care sectors, and more recently he's undertaken a PhD through the Institute of Child Protection Studies. Reese is part of an ARC linkage grant study investigating models of contact between children and out-of-home care and their families. So I work with the Institute of Child Protection Studies and we, uh, we do a lot of work based in the ACT Sydney and Melbourne and we do a lot of work um, around the children and families uh, sector and not all of our research but a lot of our research really focuses on trying to bring the voices and experiences of children and young people themselves into the debates around policy and practice. And that's really what um, my research has focused on over the last couple of years. Um, and the latter part of the presentation today is gonna to be exploring some of the things that um, have come out from interviews with children and young people. My research uh, that I'll be sharing later, it does come from the children in long-term care, their experiences. Uh, but I think there's some really useful overlaps there. So I'm gonna start by looking at a bit about the relationship between contact and reunification from the literature, from what we know already. And then start to pull out some of the, the lessons we've learned from research over the past decades about what best, pra best practice around contact and re reunification looks like. Then I wanna share some of the findings from my own study um, with you, and then pull it together hopefully at the end with some, some implications for practice. So that's where we're heading. As Professor Fernandez talked about earlier, there's a really strong and consistent uh, correlation throughout research between contact and reunification or restoration. Um, and, and way back in the mid-70s, uh, David Fanshall uh, was the first to sort of make a note of this in a large study in the United States. And he was so excited by this that he, he talked about um, monitoring contact, the amount of contact as a really useful predictor to predict whether children are going to return home or not. So he talked, he, he used these words. He said, like the frequent monitoring of body temperature for assessing the health of, health of patients in hospitals, the visitation of children should be carefully scrutinised as the best indicator we have concerning the long-term fate of children in care. This has been... Uh, this has been um, reinforced by study after study um, over the last few years, including studies here in Australia. So it's quite a well-established cor correlation. But a number of researchers have started to note that what was originally seen as a correlation is starting to be seen in some sectors as having a causative link. So that is um, that there's some assumptions that higher rates of contact will necessarily will actually bring about an increased chance of restoration. And there's some issues with that. Um, there's some real issues with getting mixed up between the correlation and the causation in this area. Um, so for a start, it's quite problem problematic from a research perspective. Um, I'm sure you all remember your Research 101 classes from many years ago that correlation and causation are not the same thing. Um, but when we've gone back and looked over the data, it's, it's pretty clear that there's other um, other variables that are actually much stronger predictors. So for example, positive social work assessments and also child adjustment are some examples of other variables that have been shown to have really strong predictors uh, for reunification. So unsurprisingly, those children who tend to be doing quite well and parents who are showing capacity for um, change and being able to make changes, uh, two things are happening. They're more likely to get increased levels of contact and they're also more likely to have their child restored, to the children to have it restored to their care. So that's where the correlation's coming from. But we need to be careful about slipping up into, into causation there. Because we know that contact can be really positive and it's been associated with a huge range of positive benefits. Um, placement stability, preventing idealisation of birth parents, we can talk about that a little more later. Identity development, reunification, which is what we're talking about today, and also child wellbeing. But there's another body of literature that consistently shows us that there's a whole range of risks around contact as well. Um, 
some researchers highlighted loyalty conflicts, distress, practical issues, and placement breakdowns. And a study by uh, Julie Selwyn back in um, mid-2000s actually found that they had a, uh, 130 um, children that they followed um, over time, and they found that one in five of those children actually experienced abuse on their contact visits. So that was in the UK. So there are some real risks that we need to bear in mind as we think about contact and make plans for contact. There's an interesting study that is going to then frame um, the rest of the talk, and we're going to come back to it at the end, because I think it's picked up some um, really key points that overlap really well with some of the findings that have come out of research with children and young people directly. Um, so Cleaver, back in 2000, found these five um, factors. This was from a qualitative analysis, a relatively small qualitative analysis of case files. Um, and they found that um, these five things were really uh, useful at predicting whether um, reunification was more likely through contact. And so there was five things around contact. Parents were motivated, eager to change, and willing to accept help. I find that an interesting one because I, I imagine that lots of the parents who come into uh, engagement with child protection systems like this are uh, probably quite unlikely to have their children removed in the first place, I would have thought. But there's the point that they've seen in the, in the notes around contact, these sorts of attitudes, and they've been really um, powerfully associated with um, reunification over time. So they found where contact was purposeful and aimed at strengthening the parent-child relationship, and we're going to talk about that a bit more in a second. Where contact was a positive experience for the child, and where contact was resourced and supported, taken slowly and regularly reassessed, and where parents and children themselves contributed to contact review and planning. Over the last maybe 15 years, there's been some attempts to trial some different models of supporting contact. So we're thinking about what does best practice around contact look like. This isn't specifically related to reunification. It's related to good outcomes around contact. Um, and there's one model, really, and the, the second one there is, is actually based on the first that's starting to get a little bit of evidence around it. And it's quite promising. From a research perspective, uh, it's not particularly robust um, research, so we need to be a little tentative about the findings. But it's a really promising approach. There's some, a worker who works with the parent around contact and is present before, during, and after contact for that parent. So there's some preparation work that goes in before contact, goal setting, identifying sorts of things that they'd like to see happen in that contact session. And then during the session, that worker is there present and is able to coach and model, um, assist, actively draw alongside and support the parent during contact. And then there's a debriefing session that takes place after the contact. Again, the research around this isn't particularly robust, but there were some really promising findings from this, and particularly parents themselves have reported really positive um, they, they like this, the parents who've been involved with research around this have reported really positive, spoken positively about this approach. The enhanced therapeutic contact model is really a development of that approach and it fo it's a bit more structured and it's really focused around strengths-based um, approaches with parents as well. Before we get to talk to some of the research that um, I've been, the uh, children and young people that I've been speaking with, I just wanted to raise this idea about the purpose of contact. And something else that comes out quite clearly in the literature is the importance of a, a shared goal and a shared understanding from everyone involved around what the purpose of contact is. So at different points of contact, uh, depending on where uh, that child and family are up to in, um, in the care system, we, we might have his, his uh, Bullen and colleagues, uh, my, um, my colleague uh, with the K-Contact study, has sort of found these five key um, purposes that tend to be used at different points for different types of contact. There may be, uh, contact may be used specifically for reunification. So that might be where a child's transitioning back into the home environment. You might start to do overnight stays. The purpose there is really about, it's, it's the latter stages of a restoration plan. Um, earlier on, or perhaps at all throughout all sorts of contacts, is this idea of maintaining relationships as a really core principle of contact, um, to maintain and strengthen the parent-child relationship. 
I should acknowledge at this point that I'm speaking specifically about parent contact because that's the focus of my research. And that is not for one second to undermine the, the relevance and importance of contact with other um, siblings, former foster carers, grandparents, um, friends. We, there's a growing recognition in the literature around the importance of those relationships for children. Um, so I don't want to suggest that they are not important. Um, it's just not the focus of this particular talk. Um, but it's around the relationships around maintaining and strengthening that parent-child relationship. In long-term out-of-home care, once children are perhaps, um, the prospects of returning to, f to home are, are, are very low, often workers will talk about identity as, the main, um, as a main goal of contact. It's maintaining a, a links to family, culture and history in order to foster a sense of identity. Something that comes up from workers often is this idea around preventing the idealisation of birth family. So assisting children to have realistic expectations of their parents, which is another thing that comes up from time to time. And particularly early on uh, in a child's engagement with child protection systems is this purpose of assessment. So contact can be a tool to assess the family. There's some concerns about uh, using contact primarily for assessment. So there's some research, research um, suggests that contact's usually an unrepresentative environment um, and parents really need support. And, and Naismith, in, a few years ago, recognised there's a real role conflict for supervisors, so particularly in the context of supervised contact. There's a real role conflict between providing support for parents and gathering evidence to inform assessments. So through the course of the study I've been involved with, I had, a, had opportunities to have conversations with caseworkers um, in child protection and also with contact supervisors in the ACT. And I had a really interesting case where, you know, you have a conversation and you're pretty sure that separate conversations on separate days, they're, they're talking about the same family. Um, so I had a conversation with the uh, contact supervisor who was talking about how she really wanted to help and support this mother who was struggling and didn't know, didn't have great skills um, around just the basic care of her infant. And she really wanted to get involved and model and coach and draw alongside the parent. But she felt like when she was doing that, the child protection worker was uh, getting involved and getting on the phone and saying, back off, because I need to understand. I need to know whether this parent can do it on their own. And when I had a, the conversation with the worker, this, this is the message that came up. And they said, I, you know, I need to know whether this parent can do this on their own. I'm trying to make a decision, a recommendation to inform court about whether this child can return home or not. And so I need to know. I need to know. So for me, that's, I suspect what that worker was doing was actually prioritising the purpose of contact in the eyes of the worker was around assessment and prioritising assessment and that ev evidence, evidence gathering. Whereas for the contact supervisor, it was really around the relationships and maintaining and strengthening the relationship there. Um, and obviously, if we're seeing uh, contact as an evidence gathering exercise, then it really undermines that idea of the visit coaching model, because that contact supervisor is very unlikely to be able to be a supportive presence for that parent if they're also then gathering evidence which is going to inform a court proceeding. So that's not to say that we can't use contact for assessment, of course, and there may be situations where that's absolutely justified as the, the only approach. But it's just some flags, I guess, to be mindful of how we're thinking about contact. And what the research says is that if, that if everyone is on the same page, so the workers, the supervisors, the children, if they're old enough, the parents, are all on the same page and understand, have a shared understanding around the goals and purposes of contact, that it's a much more positive experience for everyone. Before we get, get into the research that I've been working on, I just want to acknowledge that contact is complicated and contested. I want to tell you where th my research has kind of come from. And there's really significant questions outstanding around the frequency of, duration, uh, frequency of contact, the duration of contact, how long it should go for, how often, that really remain unanswered. But the best advice um, from research is really around 
Uh, we need individualised approaches that are sensitive to the needs of children and young people. That's really the heart of delivering quality contact. So, the question that ra raises for me that's informed this study is, well, what are the needs of children and young people around contact? So my research question is how do children and young people in out-of-home care experience and make sense of contact with their birth parents? And as I said before, this was focused on long-term out-of-home care and supervised contact specifically, though it's quite a broad definition of supervision. In the ACT, and I suspect it's similar here, lots of contact is supervised by foster carers or with fairly low levels of supervision. Um, so it was a whole breadth of, of types of supervision. And it is with parents again. This was part of the K-Contact study, which some of you may have heard of. It's actually happening here in New South Wales at the moment. Um, and it's, it's actually trying to build a more robust evidence base around the interventions, around how we get contact right, and how we deliver contact in the best possible way. It's quite a large study. It's been happening across multiple states. And the hope is there that in a few years' time we'll be able to get up and where I was talking about a visit coaching model, we'll be able to present a model to you that has a really robust evidence base behind it. So that's the hope there. I conducted some children, children's reference groups, which is a process that we use often um, in the Institute. Uh, and then I did 22 in-depth interviews with children and young people. And I, the first interview was really around their experiences of contact. We like to give children as much choice and flexibility with their studies as possible. So in the reference groups, we developed a whole bunch of different tools and talked about different questions and different ways we could explore children's experiences. And they were put together in a bunch of resources, which I then used when I went out and interviewed children. And they got to choose which bits they did and which bits they didn't. Um, so you'll see a kind of mix of, um, of approaches. It's children aged 8 to 14, 14 years in long-term out-of-home care. It was based in the ACT. 15 boys and 7 girls. It was interesting. I just, that, was, that was reflective of the referral list I got from our partner agencies. Had more boys on it than girls. Um, and 9 participants identified Aboriginal. 18 of those young people chose to be involved in follow-up interviews between 6 and 9 months later. And that interview looked at what had changed, what had, what had changed during that time, and also started to explore how children make sense of their experience of contact. We're not focusing on that so much today. One of the key questions, and which informs some of the, the findings I'll be sharing with you, is was this, what does it feel like for you on contact visits? And we used a range of different tools to do that. I suspect some of you are quite familiar with the Innovative Resources um, website. They've got a range of really useful engagement and um, tools. So this is from their Funky Fish Pack, which is really um, popular. Um, lots and lots of the children loved using these, and they are really valuable. Um, I've used them in practice settings before, and actually found them really useful in research as well. Um, so it's a big pack of cards, tactile cards, that children can flip through. And the question was, really, which one of these pictures, which one of these cards looks a bit like what it's like for you on contact visits? And then we can ask and explore what that's like. So you'll see how that works. The other thing we used was these kamochis. I don't know whether anyone's seen those, but they're like little soft toys that come in a bag. Um, they've got um, little smiley faces on one side and the word on the other. It's a really useful engagement tool, so we use it when we do our research to check in at the start. We say, can you pick one that, um, that uh, looks like, a bit like how you're feeling now? Or some of those who use words use the words on the back. Uh, and most of the activities we do, we'll do ourselves as well. So we pick one too um, and talk about that. And we pick a few, few different ones. So often children might say they're a bit nervous or a bit uh, scared or whatever. And then we use it again at the end to do a check-in and see how, how they're doing at the end of the interview. Um, and that's usually really nice because kids will say, oh, I felt brave. I felt like I've been able to talk about some things that might make a difference for other young people young people in the future. Um, but if there are any issues there, hopefully it'll come up in that, in that checkout. And kids like them as well. Um, they're tactile, they're fun. Very quickly, just um, want to talk about care histories. So um, around half of them had spent the vast majority of their lives in their current placement, so had quite stable care histories. Um, had been removed quite early and placed quite, placed quite um, 
permanently placed early. The remaining half were a fairly even split between ch children who'd been removed at a later age but had a relatively, still relatively stable care history, um, and another group of children who had lots of placement changes, five, six, seven, and one nine-year-old boy had had 15 placements um, at age nine. But generally, most of the group had a pretty stable um, time in care. When I asked children and young people what are uh, what was the best thing, or visits are good when, finish the sentence, or what's the best or most important thing about visits, there was a real convergence of responses around seeing, seeing parents. That was the most important thing. I like seeing all my family together, see my mums when I get to see my brothers, not just parents sometimes, fun to see them, visits are good when I'm with my family. So start to unpack this a bit and find out what that meant. Is it physically seeing them? Um, so we, he, oh, here's some examples. So Izzy, she picked these two fish to represent what it feels like on visits, and she said, I was happy. I was happy to see my mummy. Um, and here's Mia, who's 11. I felt happy to see my mum and dad. The gold is like my mum and dad. It's like the treasure she's been looking for. Um, so what does it mean, though, to actually see parents? I suggested, is it a bit like catching up? And that was pretty widely rejected. No, 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 catching up's too kind of superficial. Um, seeing is what you do when you have a better bond with someone. And talked about being there with them, sharing the moment, spending time together. So here's an example from Ben. He said, I was really exhilarated to see her because most of the time I just ring her up on the phone, which is on a given day. So when I see her, it just makes me feel like I'm finally seeing another part of my life that I've actually missed out on most of the time. And when she arrived, I was like, yay, mummy, and I gave her a hug. That sense of connection there. What was interesting was that seeing also had this active component to it. And often just talking was really quite difficult and problematic, and we'll see some of that um, in a minute. Daisy said, oh, it gets boring. We just talk a lot and we don't have much fun. So she's there, she's seeing her parent, but that's not actually seeing because it's just talking. Um, we just sit there and we talk. It's like, whoa, I'm getting kind of bored talking already. <laughs> so there's this sense of active means, and, and, and the, the reference group were actually really helpful here um, because they uh, clarified. Um, so here's some examples. Seeing means to be able to do things and go places, playing with them, actually doing things. And the children's reference group that I, I met with a few times over the course of the project pulled all these together and they, they came up with this. They said it means being there with them and actually doing things. That's the recipe for these children and young people of a good visit. This is what a good visit looks like. So here's an example. Um, this uh, young person, Mia, um, she said she had visits with a large sibling group. It was chaos often. Um, you know, there was heaps of people there, heaps of supervisors. And she said, but there are moments in the visit where we all um, come together and it's like when the fish crash into each other. And they're the bits um, we play together. And this family time, she called it, was the best bit because they were all together. I'm going to go quickly through some positive experiences. Um, you know, common to positive experiences were warm greetings. Uh, there's a, an example from Cristiano there. He said, that's my big smiley face when I see my mum. Um, in visits that were going really well, I had a look at the visits that were just sounded great. And it was just being together, having fun all the time. That's what it looked like. Um, so um, what was really interesting is that some of the, uh, it, it really, the activities depended completely. So this one, she talks about, Dad will try and make all the time for me that he can. It's good because he always plays basketball and stuff with me and he gets distracted, but usually because he's gone to get the ball and then he finds something else and it's like, oh, that looks cool. And he shares it with me and I get distracted too. And they go off. She talked about the leaf. They'll go leaf hunting together. So they have these activities they do together. Um, Cristiano, who you saw before, talked about TV. And one of his favourite things to do on visits was TV, which is interesting because most kids, as you'd expect, really don't like TV. But the difference was, of course, that TV was something he did with his dad. He sat on his dad's lap. They watched, they had the shows that they watched, the bits that they laughed at together. So it was a tool for engagement between the two of them. And that was the real shift. So one of the, the key things was the what you do on visits varied massively from child to child. 
But when I started to look at it, it was pretty clear that it was about this being with and doing together. A whole lot of things got in the way of this. Um, and often it was around larger visits with lots of siblings. Um, so Beck here said, this fish is like staying on the sideline of everything and kind of hidden because everyone is rushing past and doing stuff and they don't actually take the time to notice that the fish or person is there. She just felt like she slipped into the background a bit. <laughs> Rihanna here um, used a different card pack and it's not always large visits. She had a one brother and her mum was really quite... Um, anxious and hypervigilant about her brother who had special needs. And she picked card after card, I haven't put them all here. I don't have time to go with them all, go through them all. But her visit, her experience with her mum was about just waiting for mum to focus on her and pay attention to her because she felt like all the time um, it was her brother getting the attention. So she felt like getting left out in the rain, like a ball sitting there waiting to be played with, a flat tire, um, or just this anxiety around time running out and we haven't done anything together yet. It was a really nice um, wrap up to this one actually because uh, at follow up, um, I came and saw her again nine months later and uh, I, do, I, I, th I think based on some of the things she talked about here, she went and spoke to a social worker about this and they decided to shift the contact so her brother would come an hour early and then they'd have an hour together and then he'd go and then she'd have an hour with her mum on her own. And she was loving that, really simple solution that worked for that family. Um, the Mia before who talked about all the, um, the fish crashing into each other and her favourite bit about being family time all together, her brother Patrick um, had a completely different view of what being together with family looked like. For him, he talked about these few occasions on these massive chaotic visits when he gets to spend one-on-one -on -one time with his mum or dad. But most of the visit, it felt like being in a cage because there's no space, we don't get a say. And he was in constant competition with his siblings, that was his experience, for his parents' attention. Mason picked um, the, the shark and the little fish as him and his little brother on his visit and they go and play together. And the other one on the right, um, is at the end of a visit and he's leaving and the little, I don't know if you can see the little seahorse there, that's his little brother and the shark's his mum. So she's kind of scary. Um, and that's his experience on visits of his mum. But he actually managed that. They went to a soft play area and he would manage that by going and playing with his brother, having a little bit of time with mum, but he was in control of that movement, go off play, come back when he's ready, and he could control that movement back and forth with mum. And he actually coped okay, seemed, as far as I could tell, to be coping pretty well with the visits. So it's just that point of, if the being together bit's not working, still providing opportunities for fun that children have flexibility to come and go to, seems like it can be uh, a really powerful way of giving children that freedom and flexibility to control and manage some of the emotions that come out in their visits. And the really difficult ones, of course, is when there's no being with and there's no opportunities for fun. So Daniel talked about his scary backyard and there's just nothing to do and no connection there. Basically making the point, lots of the questions we ask around contact about supervision is, the answer is it just seems to depend. For the children and young people I spoke to, some of them supervision was a really important safety net, some of them it was an intrusion into their visits and, and, and impacted on. Hmm. Again, around location, some kids don't need anything because they just can connect with their parents really easily in any environment. Um, whereas Paul here feels like he's done everything. And most of the things he listed were all the other things that kids say, oh, I want to do that on a visit, and I want to do that on a visit, and I want to do that on a visit. He's going, I've done them all, they're all rubbish. Um, <laughs> so again, it's about um, understanding what, what's gonna, what, what having fun together looks like for that child and that family. Again, care involvement can be really helpful, playing together, being family together. Whereas um, little Izzy, whenever her carer's there, was just terrified she calls her carer mum, but she knows that won't be okay with mum. So she's really worried whenever her carer is there that she's gonna accidentally slip up and call carer mum and that will be a big, big problem in her mind. One of the interesting things is that uh, children felt like they had pretty low agency around contact. Interestingly, they felt like they could go or not, 
they actually had a binary choice about going or not going. But in terms of actually seeing some of the things that they'd like to see actually happen in contact, they didn't feel like they had a huge amount of control over that. Um, and just a very quick note around um, for those children who um, really can't find a way over years and years and years to connect with their parents. Actually, many of them are quite interested in other ways of connecting. So maybe not face-to-face -face contact, but um, Olivia here talked about the importance of um, finding out information she'd like to know about her family, if not spend time with them. It's just a very quick point about Mason, the one whose mum was a shark. His perception of his mum had completely changed on the second interview because he got a surprise and she was really nice. There was one little interaction, from what I could tell, where she smiled and was nice and engaged with him, and that completely changed the way that he saw and understood his mum. Which I think is a real sign of hope um, that perhaps little changes within parents and the way visits are managed can have really positive benefits. I'm going to wrap up here, um, but children and young people talked about being with and doing fun things together with their family. But again, the ways they wanted to do that um, varied massively. Um, and where visits weren't going well, those opportunities to still have fun despite the difficult um, contact are gonna be, um, from the children I spoke to, gonna be really, really important. Um, and that point about giving access to information and that things can change.